had a lot of stuff happen to me that, to be very honest, just crushed my heart. It crushed the way that I was living, my confidence, my ability to connect, and my openness. I closed my heart. And so, after about a year of struggling with that and resisting what's human nature, which is to reach outward and try to fix something by taking other things and putting it in, instead I went inward to see what was already there. And I went silent for the first time, for a whole year that is, for 365 days, just to see what would happen, what was there. And as I did that, for most of that year, it was blissful. It was amazing. There was just new awareness, presence. I was seeing beauty all around me. And then the last week, something changed. I noticed that I got very judgmental. I started looking around me and judging almost everything. And I had to really question myself, why suddenly am I judging so much? Why have I suddenly become so upset and anxious? And I realized when I asked myself, because we have to ask ourselves questions. This is radical honesty. It's not about what we share with people outside of us. It's what we share with ourselves about ourselves. Because we're normally not that honest. And so I asked myself honestly, why am I being judgmental? And this voice came and it said, because you failed. And I realized in that moment that what brought me into silence was a sense of failure and then coming out of that silence. In that last week of it, I looked around and the results that I had unconsciously put as an expectation hadn't occurred. They weren't there. You see, I thought that my heart being full again would mean that I was either in a relationship, in love, somehow sharing a partnership. And I wasn't. There was a part of me that thought, wow, I failed again. A whole year in silence for nothing. And then as I moved a little deeper into that and I felt what it was, something shifted, something cracked, something opened. And it was the best insight that I had out of that entire year. It was that what we seek in the world, what we seek of ourselves, our wholeness, our purpose, our passion, it's not something that we can discover because the discovery is always outside of you, but it's only something that we can uncover because it's uncovering when it's within you. Does that make sense? We cannot discover who we are. All we can do is uncover who we are because we're who we are from birth onward. It's not something that we get to discover outside or something that we discover over years of time or through practice or education or knowledge or learning. It's by settling, being still, maybe silent. So that all the layers and the stories that our minds have brought together and gathered over the years, both the ones we tell ourselves and the ones that other people tell us, they can start to just shed away, dissolve, let go. And then what's left is you. Now the problem is that we have forgotten that there's a you that still exists there. There's this idea, another story, that who you are is all of these other layers. And so as they start to melt away, because they'll do this naturally, you freak out. Have you noticed yourself get anxious when you start to settle? When there's nothing to do, when you actually have time to rest, does your mind start to go, oh, I need to do something, I need to be going somewhere, I need to get this done or that done? This is the unease of the ego mind. And the ego is not an enemy. It's actually your best friend. It's just there to defend the status quo, to keep you comfortable, to keep you safe, secure. And so fighting the ego is not the point, but rather recognizing what's going on and remembering that there's something that came before the ego. I like to think of it like if you take a glass and you begin to pour water into it and that water is all of the stories, the conditions, the history, the emotions, the experiences, the knowledge, the things people have told you, the things that you have found out on your own. Everything that's ever occurred in your life is this water that you're pouring into this cup. 
And eventually, you become attached to those things. You start to identify to that water. And as you become attached, it freezes like a big block of ice. And you forget that the cup exists. Now what happens if you take a block of ice and you just leave it out? It melts. And that's the scary part, because since you forgot that the cup exists, all of a sudden when that ice starts to melt, which is just the expressions of who you are, it's not who you are. But as those expressions start to melt away, you freak out, you get scared because you think, <gasps> I'm going away, I won't exist anymore. I won't know who I am. Which is always funny to me because we spend most of our lives trying to find out who we are. And yet, we're also protecting who we are. Doesn't that mean that we already know who we are? And so what I invite you to do is to remember that the cup exists the container. And that container is just the potential of who you are. It's not an actual cup, it's not an actual box or framework, but rather it's the potential. I had another teacher once say a beautiful thing. He said, the most valuable thing in the world is emptiness. You see, the emptiness of something is what gives it utility, gives it usefulness. If any of you came into this cafe today to come and sit down to listen to me speak and there were no empty seats, then there is no use, there is no usefulness, there's no ability, potential for you to come, to show up. And so for this reason, emptiness is the most valuable, significant thing. Because it allows for something else. In that same way, if we take a look at that cup and we have filled it with all these stories, well, it's not empty. <laughs> Which means that as we seek new experiences in life, there's no room for it. We want to be this, we want to be that, but we're going, yes, but I can't let go of being this and I can't let go of being that. But then there is no space. Emptiness, letting go, non-attachment of the teachings of Buddha and many other religions and traditions. So, coming out of that year in silence, I remember I gave a two-hour talk in Bali. It was the day that I came out of silence. Somebody in the crowd asked, said, what are you going to do next? And I remember thinking, I just did a year in silence. Give me a break. <laughs> Let me rest. But what actually came out of my mouth was I want to inspire, at the time, 100,000 other hearts to feel, to find, to uncover the same insights that I am. That was two years ago, and now it's a million hearts is the goal. And as I started to give these talks, as I started to understand more and more just what that silence meant for me, what that space of the heart is, I realized that it's made up of three components. Acceptance permission, and expression. Acceptance, permission, and expression. So acceptance, this one is really important because it's the first. And without it, you can't get the permission, you can't have the expression. Normally we accept in a false way. Where we think we are in acceptance, we are just tolerating. It's different. You guys know the word tolerate? The difference being that if you are simply waiting for something to pass and you're okay with it for now, you say, okay, I can deal with this for now. I'll suffer through whatever it is because I know at the end what I want is going to be there. That's tolerating. That's not acceptance. It's very different. Acceptance also doesn't mean to be okay or like what it is. We often think, oh, but if I accept it, it means I'm giving up. I'm saying, okay, this is how it will always be. Acceptance is simply recognizing the reality as it is in this moment. That's it. It's just saying, oh, this is what's real. I will not deny it any longer. Because until you accept that, until you recognize it fully, you have no power, no ability to actually change it, to move forward, to allow it to move you. Because you're running a race towards a goal, a destination, but you don't know where you're beginning from. 
One of my favorite ways to explain this, I share this in almost all my heart talks because it's just fun for me. It's like you've gone on Amazon.com. Have you guys been on Amazon ever? Ordered a book or something? Well, you go on Amazon and you're looking for the perfect book for you. Maybe you're going traveling or maybe you're just wanting to find something new in your life. Maybe you're trying to find a self-help guide, something that's going to give you the steps towards your own enlightenment, your own discovery of self or uncovering. <laughs> and you finally find one, and it literally it says, Who Are You? by Rodolfo Young. And you see it there. <laughs> and as you see it there, you go, yes, that's the book for me. And so you, you press OK, and it goes to the billing page, the payment. That's okay. You give that because you know it's an investment in yourself. You know that you have to give time, energy. You have to allow something to move through you. You must commit to it. So you do that. That's easy. And then it gets to the third page. This is the tricky one. It's the shipping page, home address. And you sit there with this blank look on your face because you don't know because you haven't accepted where you're at. And so all the resources, all the abundance of the world, everything that you've been asking for wants to be delivered to your doorstep, but because you haven't accepted where your door is, it doesn't know where to go. So acceptance, number one, first thing. Simply recognize where you are in this moment. Next comes permission. Now permission is almost as simple as you open the door to accept the delivery. <laughs> because so often we wish for something and then as soon as it comes, we go, oh, but I'm, yeah, I'm not worthy, I'm not enough, I haven't done this, I haven't done that. Oh, no, that should be for my next door neighbor, not for me. Please return to sender. Have you ever had this happen where literally in, in real life a delivery has come to you and maybe it was something that you would like to have but you know you didn't order it. You don't think you ordered it. And you go, oh, no, sorry, wrong, wrong recipient, wrong address. Let me send that back. And it doesn't just happen in a package come into your home, but how often has a compliment been given? How often has an opportunity been presented? How often have you been asked to share who you are and you thought, oh, no, I'm sorry. This is, you weren't meant to ask me for that or give that to me. And so you denied yourself permission to receive. You blocked it in some way by putting up some wall, whether it was a wall of protection or a wall because you thought you weren't enough. You hadn't done something to deserve it. We have this mentality in the world that we have to work for things, that we have to earn things. Whether that be something as abstract as earning somebody's trust which is ridiculous. <laughs> I'll tell you why in a moment. To earning a position at work, to earning a wage, earning a living, whatever it is. We are in the moment that we came into this world and every moment since then, perfectly worthy and enough to receive everything that's being given. Why else would it be being given? <laughs> Just from a business standpoint, if somebody was offering me something constantly and I thought I wasn't worthy, but they did, well, they're wasting their time. But they keep doing it, so obviously it's probably on my side <laughs> as the recipient that needs to change something. And so open your door, receive the packages, put down the walls. I often get asked the question, but if you put your walls down, how do you protect yourself? There's energies out there that are bad. No, there's not. <laughs> there is a way of receiving it that can be negative. But energy is energy. Maybe when it was given, let's say somebody's angry at you and they shout at you. In that moment, the energy coming from them was negative. But in the moment that you chose to receive it, you can choose how to receive it. What story will you tell yourself as you do so? We have complete control and power over how energy and life affects us by how we see it, by how we receive it, by how we feel it. Now, that doesn't mean that you just open up everything and welcome whatever. That can be dangerous. Not because of what might come in, but because you leak out. <laughs> then there is no container, there's no cup to hold you in each moment of your expressions. 
So here's what I often say to my coaching clients. Rather than putting walls and protections up, let your radiance, let who you are in your clarity show the boundary of who you are. Let it be the border. You can test this out. The next time that you're in a situation, whether it be something with a partner or a friend or a family member or business associate, and even if it's something as simple as you're in a rush somewhere and they've caught you in a conversation. You guys have all felt that, yes? Been stuck in a conversation and it's really one side and you're going, I gotta go, I gotta go. <laughs> in that moment, test this out, be clear. See what happens when you allow your clarity to be your protection instead of you putting a wall up, which means that you're actually not connecting with the person, which is probably why they're continuing to speak. <laughs> because they haven't gotten the point and all they're seeking, all we're all seeking is connection. And if in that moment you can drop your wall, connect in, and give them a clarity of, you know, I'm in a big rush, can we pick this up later? How much easier would life be if we could all just be that clear? If we put down all the stories and instead just allowed what in the moment, because we accepted it, to be the reality. Now here's something I've discovered around permission, around these walls, and around this idea that it's a story we all have about not being enough. Have you ever in your life had that moment of clarity where you're like, oh, for some reason I don't think I'm enough for this or for that or for this person? Here's the problem. Because you have put so much of your energy into the wall, into your protection, when you look inward to see, okay, well, who's there? It's not whole. It's not complete because 60, 70, 80% of you is in the wall. So, no, it isn't enough. <laughs> Because you have divided yourself, you have separated yourself out. And so as soon as you put that wall down, as soon as you bring back the integrity, the wholeness of who you are, then this question of am I enough completely goes away. But you have to do it not by looking from the outside, because that means again you are separating yourself out, but rather by feeling from within. So I'll often suggest to people that Rather than trying to think your way into enlightenment or think your way into peace and happiness, think your way into joy and bliss, feel it. In this moment, give yourself permission. You don't have to earn it. <laughs> it's as simple as that. I love when a coaching client comes to me and they go, you know, my dream would be, let's say, to be a yoga teacher. It's wonderful. Why aren't you a yoga teacher? Oh, because I haven't done all the training and I haven't done this and that. But you know yoga. Yeah, yeah. And you have people asking you to teach them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go be a yoga teacher. No, I can't. I, I need to get the certification and I need the education. And then I need to practice for at least a year but not be paid. And then maybe I'll have earned it. <laughs> Give yourself permission in this moment. And all that permission is is literally taking down the story, the wall, the story of what's blocking you from having it. Because that's all that's ever blocking you. If you look at other people and you go, wow, they have everything that I wish I could have, they're no different from you. The only difference is that they didn't put the same story that you are. They're not telling themselves that they can't. They're saying, I can't. So give yourself permission. Now, once you've done this, once you have accepted truly where you are at in this moment, by just recognizing it. Doesn't mean you want to stay there. It just means you say, oh, this is where I'm at. In that moment, you give yourself permission to open the door and walk through it or to let something else walk through it to you. And then you'll notice automatically, it's instantaneous. It doesn't take any effort. An expression occurs. Maybe it's a new form of reality for you. Maybe it's a new form of experience. Maybe it's a new connection. Maybe it's something that comes up through you to be shared with the world. And it takes no thought. It just happens. But first you must accept and give yourself permission. How many times have you been in a conversation or even maybe listening to somebody else's conversation and something came up in you, a truth, an expression, and your mind went, no, no, I don't have permission. It's not, it's not my conversation. I, I shouldn't say anything. Or maybe somebody's being really down on themselves. 
criticizing who they are, and you're looking going, I don't get it, you're beautiful, why? But you don't say it because you go, oh, but maybe they'll think this, maybe they'll think that. What if in that moment you accepted the reality, which was, hey, right now an opportunity is presented to be a messenger, to share something. Now, mind you, you have to be careful here because you have to know, is it a feeling that's come up or is it an opinion, a thought? Very big difference. People don't like to be told opinions. But if it's a feeling, if it's something that comes up that maybe expresses itself without even you thinking about it, maybe through a smile, maybe through a laugh, maybe through a, a nod of acknowledgement. I experience this all the time as I'm traveling right now. I love going on public transportation, on the buses, on the U-Bahn, on the S. Because I sit there and I look around and most people are very closed off. They're going, I'm on my way somewhere. And I'm sitting there, normally, looking around with this big smile on my face and making eye contact, which is very dangerous. <laughs> and what's amazing, though, is that when somebody else looks up and they see that I'm just looking at them with a smile. You can't do it with just the eye contact. That's kind of creepy. Don't do that. <laughs> no, don't do that. You do it with a gentle softness and acceptance. And the reactions, the response that I get is normally people lighting up. Because what I'm doing is, since I gave myself permission to connect, I give them permission to connect too. And I get these big smiles back. <coughs> and so this expression that just comes up in you, it is you. So that's the difference between it being an expression of your mind which calculates and tries to find the right words. The expression that is spontaneous, that is authentic. It's the wholeness of your whole being coming forth to meet someone, to meet the world. When you allow that, one, it's an unstoppable, unarguable truth, your truth, but it is a truth. And because of that, when others feel it, they see you. They really connect because they hear and feel and see your truth. But most of the time, because we're trying to find the right words to either candy coat or describe it the way we think they will understand, then we miss the point. And we sit there in a dialogue that nobody is actually connecting on. It's like you're on separate floors of the same building. I mentioned earlier that it is a ridiculous concept to believe that you earn somebody's trust. Have you ever been in a situation where maybe it's in a, a relationship and something has occurred, maybe you lost that trust. And so then you do everything you can. You show up in every way possible to prove you are trustworthy again. Is it ever actually in your power that the other person will trust you? Or is that a choice that they make? You see, when we believe that we can earn somebody's trust, then we are also believing that we can control them. That if I do enough, if I prove enough, if I create enough, if I manipulate enough, which is a funny thing to do when you're trying to gain somebody's trust, but we do it, <laughs> then they will trust me. All you can do is, one, trust yourself, and then come into integrity, into alignment with that. That's what I was getting at a little bit before, that when you're speaking words and phrases and ex expressing from your mind, but your feeling is different, then it's not aligned. Then your mind's over here explaining one thing and your heart's over here explaining one thing. And somebody's listening and they're going, I kind of get what you mean, but something feels off and I don't trust you because of that. And they don't even know they don't trust you. And so to, the idea to earn somebody's trust is ridiculous because it indicates that if you do enough, then their trust will come. But what it really is, is if you simply come into wholeness, authenticity, clarity, it's not a matter of being trusted, it's a matter of being heard. Because there's no space for any other doubt or story to enter when you express with wholeness. That makes sense? It's kind of logical, yeah? So we have acceptance, permission, expression. And expression 
has more to do with choice than it does with what comes up through you. It's not that you choose a way to express, as I'm saying. It's just an authentic thing that happens. When you laugh spontaneously, that's authentic. When you smile for a picture, normally not authentic. <laughs> but the smile just now, authentic. You didn't think about it, did you? Was there a moment in your mind that you said, that was kind of funny, I think I'll smile, maybe. Yes, okay, I'm going to smile. No, it just happened in the moment. And so the choice that occurs in expression is a very simple choice, and it's actually the only choice that you have in all of life, in all of reality. Choices are not about options. Choice is about will you resist or will you surrender? Meaning will you fight against the reality or will you let it move through you? This is expression in its totality, is when you open, you allow, you become soft and pliant so that something can move through you to be shared. But when you believe that it's about you controlling and being enough or doing this or doing that and that there's an agenda that you have, a plan that you have come up with, then you fight against reality. Now I can already see the thoughts and the questions in your mind and go, but then how do you get what you want? How in life if you're just supposed to let go and put your arms up and say, okay, I'm going to let the world lead me, how do I get what I want? What if, I, what if the world gives me what I don't want? This is where it comes back to trust. It's realizing that you must trust yourself and that you are the one creating the world around you. The world is not against you or for you. It's just what's happening because of you. How you see things, how you interact, who you interact with, what comes into your life has everything to do with you and how you're choosing. Are you surrendering or resisting? What's there? Because in every moment, there is an infinite number of possibilities and expression. Anything can occur, truly. But when we limit ourselves down to just, let's say, this plan that I had, then we miss all the other opportunities. And especially if we limit ourselves to, oh, I only believe that I deserve and am enough for this. That's very limiting. I love this word, this word miracle. I call it just magic, and it's the magic of acceptance, the magic of permission, it's the magic of allowing expression to happen, and it's the magic of curiosity. Miracles, for me, aren't that some higher being came down and went, ah, I've heard your wish, I've heard your prayer, ha, there you go, you have earned it, so I will give it to you. <laughs> this is not what I believe miracles are. Miracles are noticing, realizing in that moment that anything is possible. And because you give that permission, then anything becomes possible. I'll give you an example. I was in Utah, United States, giving some talks and taking part in a course where I was coaching. And I'd been going back and forth quite a bit between there and San Diego, California, which is where I used to live. And I had to be back in San Diego by 10 a.m and I was running late to the airport in Utah. I needed to be back in San Diego because I was speaking at a festival with 20,000 participants and I was supposed to lead them in meditation. So you don't want to get there late rushing because it's like, <laughs> okay. No, <laughs> it doesn't work so well. And I remember getting to the airport, walking in, I'm already like 10, 15 minutes late for the boarding passes and things. And I'm just walking in calmly I go up to the desk, and I say, I'm here for this flight. And the man looks at me and he goes, sorry, so you've missed your flight. Okay. And I just stayed standing there and with a smile on my face because I was curious. I was curious, how am I going to get back to San Diego in time? Because I know it's going to happen. I know there's a possibility. I'm curious how. And the man's sitting there looking at me, and he goes, sorry, you've missed your flight. Uh, is, is there anything else I can help you with? I don't know, I'm waiting. <laughs> and he's looking at me and he goes, you're not upset that you missed your flight? No. It just makes me curious to see what's going to happen next. He goes, do you need to be back? Oh, yes. <laughs> and I explained to him that I had 20,000 people waiting for me to lead them in meditation back in San Diego. And he goes, sir, you should be really upset. I said, why? I'm going to be back in time. He goes, 
You're not. There's no other flights. There's no. Hold on. And he starts typing into his computer. And I'm still just standing there curious, waiting to see what's going to happen. What miracle of magic might occur if I gave it permission? And he looks at me and goes, okay, don't tell anybody. But the systems for our airline and our sister airline are connected. There was no more flights on our airline. But I've booked you for free on our sister airline. You have about 15 minutes to get over to that terminal, get your ticket and go. Thank you. <laughs> Ran down. When you start to live life in this way, everything becomes a beautiful adventure. You can never expect what's going to happen, but you can know that it's going to be new. And I say that because when we go into something with an expectation, we already have an idea of what to expect, which means we've experienced it before, which means it's going to be old. <laughs> Wouldn't you rather step into every moment with novelty, with, with a sense of excitement because it's never been experienced before? Something I've noticed being here in Europe in general, especially as a contrast to Bali, which is a very laid back island kind of life. Here in these cities, everybody's going so fast. I was walking with a friend in Berlin and literally <laughs> gasping for air trying to keep up with her. <laughs> She's just having a calm conversation. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and then when I go walking on my own, I slow everything down. And then I start to notice things. I start to notice people. I start to notice buildings. I start to notice there's a dog urinating on a bush. It doesn't matter what I'm noticing, but I'm seeing what's there while most of the time we're not seeing what's there because we're rushing by. We're on our way somewhere. Can you guys relate to that? You walk out of your home, and as soon as you lock the door to leave, your mind is already wherever you're trying to get to. Maybe it's to work, or to go shopping, or to come to a talk like this. And so you're rushing. You're like, OK, I need to catch the bus for this, and I need to get the train for that. No, I need to go over here, and I need to do that. And then the whole way through, you're missing everything that's happening in between. Because the destination, this place that you ended at, that wasn't important, <laughs> because from here, you will continue on again. You never find an end. That's the point. You never reach your destination. This idea of a destiny isn't about finally getting somewhere and being like, oh, I finally got here, and I have fulfilled my purpose. But rather, destiny, I love the way that the Taoists put it. They say destiny, it's the word ming, that it's being in the right place at the right time. That's it. Being in the right place at the right time. That is your destiny. That's your purpose. It's being here now, but really being here, being present. Because if you're only half here because 20% of you is inside creating a wall, and then another 30% is in the next place that you're going, and so only 50% is here, then you're missing a lot of what's being shared. And it's not just but what I'm sharing. It might be something that this gentleman in the back is sharing with his smile. See, none of you had noticed that yet. <laughs> There's so much beauty happening all around us. I've literally, having been here and just in travel mode, because in travel mode, you slow down anyway. In Bali, I still also have the same patterns. I'm on my way somewhere. When I'm traveling, I'm like, oh, I'm just here. And I love it because it really does let me slow down to take notice of everything. And I literally, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm going to burst because of all the beauty that I see. And I've had to ask myself many times now, I'm going, is it just that I'm more aware right now? Or are there just more beautiful people in Germany? I don't know. <laughs> I think it's a combination. Everywhere that we go, the expression of beauty is there. And it really is as simple as a smile. Because beauty... See, beauty comes from the word bounty, which is something that's given. It's, you know, the, the thing that's given in a, a wedding or a marriage. It's, it's this bounty that is offered. And beauty comes from that same root word. And so to be beautiful is the essence of giving. And so when we are being our wholeness, being our full authenticity and expressing in all of that, oh, my God, we are beautiful. If you've been hurt, whether it be by family, or close friends, 
in any way that something in life feels like it has broken you, feels like it has created a wedge and a separation. In that moment, the acceptance isn't about the situation. The acceptance is in the feeling. You might feel like crying. You might feel mad. You might feel sad. That's the first thing that must be accepted is the actuality of the feeling. It's not about accepting your part in it. It's accepting the feeling, the emotion. Because what normally happens when we are hurt is we don't want to feel the hurt. And so we immediately exit it, and it's still there. But we're constantly trying to find, okay, how can I feel happy again? How can I get it back to where it was again? Well, because of that, we're denying what's real, and we're not situated where we can do something, where we can feel it, release it, move it. So that's the first step. And then with curiosity, you see what comes next. Because if it's anything but curiosity, then you're trying to control the situation still, and you haven't actually accepted. So when you fully accept, it means recognizing in that kind of a situation the feeling, the emotion, and letting your whole attention, everything, all your presence be with that. If it's that you're crying, great. If it's that you're angry, great. Let all your attention be there so that in that moment it can pass quickly. It's like taking a Band-Aid off. If you go, shh, ha, ah, okay, it's done. But if you take 10 years to get over something, <laughs> it's very painful. And pain is about resistance. It's not about what's happening or it's not about who did something or that you did something or anything. Pain is because you are fighting against what is. <laughs> As soon as you let that go, as soon as you allow something new to come through, then the pain goes also. The pain is a friction. The thing about when an event in our lives causes a ripple, causes a protection, especially a wall, is that what we want is we want to always try to get back to the time when the wall wasn't there. Because it's the separation, it's the feeling of not being connected that's hurting us. It's not whatever happened. This is why children, if you know, they're young and they're playing and so one kid does something to the other kid, for like two minutes they're angry. And then two minutes later they're playing again like nothing happened. Because they don't keep the wall up. They feel it and then they let it go and they connect again. Because they realize connection is what it's all about. And then we get angry and we build even more emotion and pain because we're going, they don't want to connect. They're being this way. And so I'm going to be this way. And we continue to keep the separation. So we talked about the three fundamentals of what I call the heart space. And it's about acceptance, finding yourself in this moment and recognizing it fully for what it is so that you know where you're at and from that, you can give yourself permission to open the door and walk into the next moment. Because life is always moving forward. That's inevitable. It's just that often, we're holding on to the moment we're in, either because we like where we're at, or we don't like where we're at, and we're trying to understand it, so we don't want to leave it. This is an odd thing. <laughs> but life is trying to move us forward, and all we have to do is give it permission to is to let go, and then that expression of movement happens. So acceptance, permission, expression. Be here, allow, and let yourself move without resistance. And no matter what comes up in life, and this is the beauty really of what came through for me in that first year of silence. Now I'm doing my second year in silence, only breaking it for these heart talks. Is that I realized all the pain that I had when I went into silence was all just another story. The feeling that my heart was shattered into a million tiny pieces was just a story. It was just a layer. It was a moment of experience that in its expression came and also wanted to go, but I did it nothing. I held on to it because I identified to it. I became attached. Now that happens pretty automatically because this is how we've been conditioned in life. Because we forgot that the cup exists. We forgot that the container is there. We forgot that the true 
the list of everything is its emptiness, its ability, its utility, not it being full and stable and secure. This is an illusion. Everything is changing. It doesn't have to be scary if you realize that it's changing in your favor depending on what you choose. So walk through the doors.